Hey, Bio. What up? Got another uh, quick lecture on deck here for you on the respiratory system. All things oxygen related, air related, lung related, all that kind of stuff. So let's get going. I was going to use a clear pen color for air. Then I, it's not going to work. So we're going to stick with red today. And the first question I want to ask you guys is why we breathe. And the reason why I want to ask you this is because I feel like if you're a living person, you should know why you are breathing, considering it's like the most common thing you do. You like inhale and exhale all day, every day, all the time. And if you don't know why, it's a problem. So you should know why you do the most common thing you do. Um, and a lot of people will say, yeah, a lot of people will give you this first bullet point. Yeah, it brings, you get oxygen and you, and you exhale CO2. Most people can tell you that. But what I think you guys should know, and I want you to think back to last unit, is what is the oxygen, these two questions at the bottom here, what is the oxygen used for and what is the CO2, where does the CO2 come from? Okay, so think back. Where does it come from? So I don't think most people on the street would be able to tell you that. Um, so, but you should be able to. Um, there's some terms I just want to clear up. Breathing versus respiration versus cellular respiration. So breathing is when you actually inhale and exhale. Respiration is what we're going to call when the actual oxygen is transferred from our lungs into our blood and the CO2 is transferred from our blood to our lungs and released. Um, so the actual gas exchange is what we're going to call respiration. And then cellular respiration is then the process that's happening in, inside the cells in which the oxygen is being used. So that's a little hint there for you for the last two. Think about cellular respiration if you want to answer the last two questions. So other than breathing, we actually regulate our pH through the respiratory system. We smell things, we filter the air, and we make sounds like I am right now. I am making sounds with my voice. You can hear my sounds coming out of my mouth. That is respiratory system. Uh, we also exhale a little bit of water and heat, which you've probably done before when you've like on a, on a glass, like glass or um, like a mirror or something like that. It, the water condensates on that mirror. So we're going to follow the pathway of air and just briefly stop at each place to talk about what's going on there. We're going to go in this order, talk about the nose and the mouth, then the pharynx, larynx, trachea, bronchi, and eventually alveoli. So nose and the pharynx. The nose is usually the first place air comes in uh, when we inhale, unless we are mouth breathers or we are snoring or we are running, or we're doing something where we need more air, we'll, we'll turn to our mouth. But essentially, your nose is the first place, and that's really useful because that's where our olfactory, or our sense of smell is. So we have receptors there, pick up things in the air. We also warm and filter the air as well, and we can use it to make different speech sounds. Like I talk a little differently when my nose is closed versus when it's open, I sound more normal. So our nose modifies the way we sound actually a little bit. The pharynx is this area, this sort of general area right here in the back of the throat, uh, sort of where your air, where your nasal passage and your mouth meet in the back. Um, and so they're actually connected back there. Your nose and your mouth are connected in the back. And that's called the pharynx. And the pharynx is where air goes through, but also food. And so I just want to stop here for just a moment to explain why the heck we can choke, whereas a lot of animals can't choke. Like So for example, like a horse can actually drink water and breathe at the same time. And I challenge you to try to do that. Actually, don't, don't, don't do that. That might cause you to choke. I don't want to get in trouble. So don't, don't do that, but take, take my word for it. You cannot breathe and drink water at the same time because of the way our the tubes are oriented. So it turns out that our uh, the passageway for food and air crisscross, they intersect. Whereas where where some other animals like horse, horses is just one that comes to mind, their tubes never cross, so there's no issue. So if you look at this diagram, right? So <clears throat> when you inhale air, it's going to come from your nose 
down, and it's going to go through this tube in the front. This is called the trachea, this tube here, and it's going to bring it to the lungs where it should go. When I eat food, it goes this way, down, and then it goes this way, this tube, which is the esophagus, which takes it to the stomach. Now notice there's a little flap here called the epiglottis. That is the it is that is what stops you from choking. Your life depend your life could literally depend on a very small piece of tissue at the back of your throat and whether it flaps down in time or not. So when you swallow food, that flap, that epiglottis slaps shut and closes closes the, fair, the, the passageway to your lungs off so the food slides over and into your stomach. If it doesn't close in time, which has happened to you probably before, you maybe you can cough it out <clears throat> or you choke and you die. So be careful. Don't laugh and chew food at the same time. Once you get past the, the epiglottis, now you're going down and towards the lungs, uh, you run into the, your voice box or what's called the larynx. And here you see two vocal cords. These will vibrate when you talk to make sounds. So the air passing by actually causes them to vibrate, and you can control how close and far apart they are to make different pitches and that kind of thing. Um, something that happens occasionally to these guys is they get inflamed from overuse, and it's called laryngitis. So if you ever heard of laryngitis, what that means is that the person has probably overused their vocal cords to a point where they've swollen up, and it's hard for them to talk now, and they're really sore. Then next stop is the trachea. Trachea is this, this tube right here. This tube essentially brings the air to our lungs. Um, it's got rings of cartilage around it, which make it sort of sturdy so it doesn't just collapse on itself. You can actually feel your trachea. Oh, by the way, your uh, Adam's apple, that is your larynx. So when you, when you touch your Adam's apple, you're actually touching your larynx where your vocal cords are. Right below that, you can actually sometimes feel a, um, a sort of ringed tube. And that ringed tube that you're feeling is the trachea. Within the trachea, you have some mucus that traps some particles that is really useful for trapping things like dust or bacteria or whatever is in the air that you inhale that might not be so good if it gets to the lungs. So it sort of acts like a sticky layer of um, to trap things. And then the cilia are these little hair-like um, things that sweep the mucus up this way away from the lungs so that you can get rid of it and so it doesn't hurt, hurt your lungs. Usually what happens is that mucus goes up and then just sort of goes right back around down and down your esophagus into your stomach and you never know about it. But if you have a lot of excess mucus production, sometimes you get extra coughing of mucus up, um, which you, if you're polite, you can swallow or if not, you can expel. A uh, blocked trachea is when you are choking. So if the, if the food gets all the way down into your trachea, this is really far down. So you're probably choking at that point, which would mean you'd need someone to do abdominal thrusts on you to like, force that food out. Or you can get a tracheotomy or an intubation. I'm not going to tell you what those are. You can look them up. But essentially, a tracheotomy uh, involves creating another hole that you can breathe through below the blockage. So if there's food right here, you would put a hole right in the trachea here, and then you can inhale and exhale through here instead of through your mouth. Um, all right, next stop is the bronchi. And the bronchi are two large tubes that lead to your lungs, essentially. They branch off of the trachea. They turn into little small bronchioles eventually, like these guys. And essentially, they bring the air to what we'll talk about next, which is the alveoli, which you see here, which looks like these little bundle of grapes, almost. Or like some blackberries or something like that. Uh, but essentially, two things that can happen to the bronchi. One is bronchitis, which is an inflammation of the bronchi. So a lot of extra mucus and coughing and uh, soreness happens in, the, in those tubes. An asthma attack is when the muscles around the bronchi spasm and constrict them. So the amount of air you get is really small. Uh, or really um, not enough and you can actually it actually can be pretty serious if you don't get treated um, an asthma attack can can cause suffocation uh, and then the last stop is the alveoli which is no it's not a very tasty Italian dish it's actually a uh, really important part of your respiratory system and the alveoli are where the actual 
gas exchange happens, where the oxygen from the air is transferred into your blood. It's also where the CO2, the waste product of your body, is transferred from the blood into your lungs and exhaled. Um, and so the alveoli are similar to the villi in the sense that they increase, remember the villi in, in your small intestine increases the surface area for food uh, nutrient absorption. Alveoli increase the surface area for oxygen absorption. Um, and so you actually get a lot more oxygen this way. Um, and one thing that can happen down here is pneumonia. So you've heard of pneumonia before. Essentially it's inflammation or infection in the alveoli, which usually causes a buildup of excess liquid um, in them. And it can actually be life-threatening if the liquid buildup gets too much because it can actually block the exchange of gases um, and you can slowly suffocate from that, unfortunately. Um, and then just, we we're not going to talk about blood today too much because that's the next system, but essentially we just want to make sure we know that the oxygen is, is taken from the lungs, diffuses into our blood, and is grabbed by something called hemoglobin. So I just want you to remember hemoglobin is a protein that is inside of red blood cells, which is what RBC stands for, red blood cell. And the hemoglobin will actually take the oxygen to your lungs. Or sorry, away from your lungs to uh, wherever it's needed in your body. Hemoglobin is kind of like the Uber driver of your, of your <laughs> body. It transports the oxygen around. So take a quick moment, do a quick checkpoint, compare and contrast those three disorders that we just talked about. A uh, quick explanation of how you actually inhale and exhale. So you know, you kind of know this already, I think from seventh grade, you guys might have built a little model, some of you, of how this works. But you have a muscle called the diaphragm at the bottom of your rib cage or at the bottom of your th <coughs> excuse me, thoracic cavity, way down here. And when you when it it's a muscle, so you can control it. So when it flattens out like this, it increases the volume inside of your chest and air rushes in. Then, when that muscle relaxes, it goes back to its curved resting state, which creates less volume, so your, your thoracic cavity gets smaller, and the air rushes out, which is exhalation. Okay. So that has to do with pressure, actually. So when you, when you inhale, you increase the volume in your chest, which actually decreases the pressure. And so air always flows towards where there's less pressure. And then when you exhale, again, you shrink the volume because your diaphragm relaxes back to its curved state. Volume goes down, pressure goes up in your chest, so that air goes out. So I want you, person, if you're split personality, your personality on the left and your personality on the right should explain the two opposite processes. So kind of summarize what I just said in your own words, just so that you have it down. All right, to finish up, uh, I want to just quickly mention carbon monoxide. You've probably heard of it before. It's a, this odorless, colorless gas that can be released um, by faulty equipment, not electrical equipment, but things that run on like natural gas. So like furnaces and heaters can, can release CO, uh, carbon monoxide. It's also found in car exhaust and tobacco smoke. And why it's a problem is because it outcompetes oxygen for a spot in the hemoglobin. So it's kind of like it steals, carbon monoxide is really good at stealing oxygen's Uber, right? If hemoglobin is the Uber that brings oxygen to its destination, see, uh, carbon monoxide jumps in, in, in before oxygen can get in there and blocks oxygen, which makes you slowly suffocate because you're not getting any oxygen. Right? So hopefully you have a detector at your house. Check, you should. And then lastly, something that you've heard a million times over, but I would be remiss if I did not, or be remiss if I did not mention cigarette smoking during a respiratory lecture, uh, because it is the single most preventable cause of death worldwide. Now it is going down, but it's still a really, really major problem. Um, and it causes a lot of problems that you see here on this list, some of which you already know, some of which we'll talk about later. Um, and it contains carbon monoxide, which alone should tell you that it's not healthy. Uh, it also contains nicotine, which is what's the addictive part of it, which makes people addicted to it. And then a really negative aspect is the tar. Uh, because what the tar is, is it's the burning of the plant and, and the chemicals that the plant is treated with. And when you inhale that, those are what can lead to all the different kinds of 
cancers. So those TARs are carcinogenic or are known to cause cancer. And obviously, here's a picture of a healthy lung, smoker's lung. So just the visual alone tells you, if you smoke for a long time, you're going to mess up your lungs, for sure. I mean, look at that. So um, we're going to talk about this later. So hold off on this. If you want to look it up, you can. We already talked about bronchitis. Um, and we already know what cancer is. So the one I want to just quickly mention is emphysema. So what emphysema is, is a slow deterioration of your lungs' abilities to, your lung, your lungs ability to expand. So what it, emphysema is, is someone who slowly dies of breathlessness, unfortunately. It's very, very uh, sad and very scary. So imagine trying to inhale, like you take a deep breath and exhale, right? Your lungs expand and contract and you get a nice deep breath. Someone who has emphysema, when they go to do that inhale, nothing happens, right? At the very extreme end of it. It starts off slowly, but slowly but surely your lungs can contract, can expand less and less and less. And that's something that's associated with long-term smoking. So um, don't want to end on a downer here, but it is kind of a downer, unfortunately. So yeah, don't smoke. It's not good for you. All right, I'll see you guys in class. Thanks.